Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 10. We're going to continue in our sermon series through the book of Romans, entitled Living Forever in Grace. I'm sorry, by grace. <laughs> Living Forever by Grace. And we have been looking at chapters 9 through 11 right now. It's kind of this parentheses in the middle of the book of Romans. And we saw chapters 1 through 8, Paul had been talking about the principles of the gospel, and now here, 9 through 11, he's talking about the problems of the gospel. And those problems are the fact that there's now a new way of approaching God that's been instituted by Jesus. And because there's this new way, the old way is now going to have a conflict because this new way that Jesus set up is so simple, and we're going to talk about the simplicity of that today, that it became a stumbling stone for people, and so it's very difficult for people. And we've also been talking about the fact that God does have a plan for you. He has a plan for me, and we need to know what that plan is. We need to accept that plan, and not only do we need to know it and accept it, but we also need to work that plan. We need to do the things that God's told us to do, and that can be very difficult for us, especially as we've talked about the sovereignty of God and Sovereignty of God is a very difficult for thing for us to understand sometimes, and it makes it hard for us sometimes to accept, especially when we don't like what it is that God wants us to do. We defined God's sovereignty last week this way. We said the sovereignty of God is the biblical teaching that all things are under God's rule and control, and that nothing happens without His direction or permission. And so that's difficult for us because he'll do things that we don't necessarily understand or agree with, but we as believers submitted to him need to accept his sovereignty. Not only that, but people often see Christians, not Christianity. And so they'll look at the results some Christians are getting and they'll say, well, I don't like the results they're getting. And so they don't accept God's plan or they take a look at his plan and they say, hey, that just doesn't seem easy. I don't think I'm going to do that. Or they just say, hey, that plan just seems totally irrelevant. And, and so it's very difficult sometimes for us to accept God's plan, but we as his children need to do that. We need to accept it. We need to work it, and we will find great results in our lives. Amen? Amen. So this morning, the title of the message of today is Misguided Zeal misguided zeal. Now, zeal is very important for you and for me as we go through this Christian journey. Billy Graham asked his audience at the, um, the Urbana conference in 1984, he asked this question. He said, what will you be like as a Christian 10 years from now? Many will be walking with Christ and serving various capacities around the world, but for others, there will be a tragedy because 10 years from now, they will have lost their burning zeal and love for Christ. Not necessarily because they wanted to or because they set their heart in rebellion against God's will, but because they set their life by the world's agenda. Then Christ and his great commission gradually dims. Now listen, family, we're not supposed to love God moderately. We are supposed to love him with zeal, meaning we're supposed to love him with great enthusiasm, great passion. To be zealous for God means to be on fire, and God wants us to be like that. And so it's true that we as Christians are supposed to be zealous for the things of God. We're supposed to be zealous for his word, zealous for truth. While that's true, it's also true that misguided zeal can be very, very dangerous, Misguided zeal can divide churches, it can divide homes, it can be destructive to the work that God wants to do in you and through you. Think of an airplane. You think of a 747, holds hundreds of passengers, right? Now, you've got instrumentation that helps guide that plane. You've got a pilot that helps guide that plane. You've got air traffic control and radars and all this stuff that helps guide that plane. And when all those things work properly and guide that plane properly, it's a very effective tool for transportation. You can get on a plane here at LAX and end up in Hong Kong in about 16 hours. And if everything's guided properly, that plane will land where it's supposed to land, on the runway it's supposed to land, at the time it's supposed to land. Everything will run perfect and that 400 plus passengers that are on board that 747 will end up in Hong Kong alive and well so long as that plane is guided correctly. Now, a misguided plane is 
a recipe for disaster, right? We've seen it time and time again. A plane goes off course, it ends up crashing. You don't know why, but you know, the thing is, when it's misguided, it ends up in catastrophe. Same thing with our zeal for the Lord. When our zeal is misguided, it can be a catastrophe. When our zeal is on course with what God wants it to be, it is so effective for the kingdom of God. And we need to be careful that we as believers don't have misguided zeal. So this morning, let's pick up where Paul concluded in chapter 9 by saying in verse 30, What shall we say then? That Gentiles who, do not, or who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it was written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, this stumbling stone that Paul's referring to is out of the book of Isaiah, which was a prophecy of, of course, about our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would be this stumbling stone. Why is it that he would be a stumbling stone? Well, the reason is, is because people for centuries had this idea of, a, of approaching God by their works. They, okay, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And they were trying to approach God that way. Well, when the Lord came on the scene, he brought this revolutionary way of approaching God. And we know that after he died, the veil at the temple was torn. You could enter right into the Holy of Holies. It was this whole new approach. And it wasn't based on what you do. It wasn't based on what I do. It's solely based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. When you call upon his name, you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord. Now you have access to God very new way, and because it was new, and it seemed too simple, it was a stumbling stone. It was like, well, how can it be that simple? It just can't be that simple. So it was a stumbling stone for a lot of people. Now, it's understanding the simplicity of this uh, stumbling stone is the key to the misguided zeal of Israel. It's the key to the misguided zeal of many Christians today, And it's also the key to God's present dealing with Israel and with us. So let's pick up now in chapter 10, beginning there in verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Now, in order to be saved, you have to first be in danger, right? Paul is not mincing words here. You guys are in trouble, he's saying. Now, here this morning, I'm not praying to God that you guys would be saved from a tornado. We live in Southern California. We don't live in tornado country. It would make sense if I said, hey, I want to pray for you guys that you guys wouldn't be swallowed up in an earthquake today. Then you'd be like, okay, well, Pastor Tim's praying. I don't know if he thinks there's an earthquake or what, but it would be ridiculous for me to pray that you guys would be saved from a tornado today. We don't have tornadoes here, and if we do, they're like little tiny dust twisters out in the desert you know they're they're nothing that's going to kill us and so the thing is what Paul's saying here and his words are very powerful is he's saying you guys are in danger I want you guys to be saved my prayer to the Lord is that you guys would be out of danger and he goes on in verse 2 to say for I bear witness that they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. Now, it's kind of an important thing to take a look here. Paul is actually giving these guys some credit. He's saying, I've noticed you guys have a zeal for God. But as we discussed, misguided zeal can be very dangerous. These guys have misguided zeal because what? Because it's not according to knowledge. Turn back with me, if you would, four books to the Gospel of Mark. And look at chapter 14, Gospel of Mark chapter 14. I want to share with you guys today a classic example of somebody who has got zeal for the Lord, but it's completely misguided. So Mark chapter 14, verse 32, we'll pick up. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. 
And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. Stay here and watch. Instruction has been given. We know that at this same point in time in Luke's gospel that he said, pray that you may not enter into temptation. He actually says that twice to them. But he tells them, stay here and watch. He's saying this to men who have seen him walk on water. Watch. He's saying this to men who have seen him break bread and feed thousands of people. He's saying this to a man who has raised somebody from the dead. He's saying this to a man who has healed paralytic people, healed people with all sorts of diseases, and he's telling them, I want you to stay here while I'm going to go over there and pray, and I want you to watch. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm just kind of trying to put myself in their shoes. I think my eyes would be like this, like, okay, well, what's going to happen? I went up on a mountain with you one time. You were transfigured. Like, what's going to happen next? Watch. That's the instruction that the Lord gives to them. And pray. Watch and pray. Well, verse 35, he, that is Jesus, went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, All things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. This is a huge moment in the life of Christ, a great moment of agony. And we know that his sweat became like drops of blood. So he was in some pain. He knew what was coming. He was nervous. In his, in his human form here, this guy knew that all the sin, your sin, my sin, all the sin of all the world was going to be placed on his shoulders. That the father was going to have to turn his back on him for a moment while that took place. He was in agony. And he had told these men, watch and pray. Well, verse 37, they, then he came and found them sleeping. And said to Peter, Simon, why are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. That's the second time he tells them. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, when I was a kid, my parents called me Timmy or Timbo. That was my name. Timmy or Timbo. Now, when I was in trouble, guess what I heard? Timothy Roy Thompson? I mean, I heard the full name. Now, parents, we all know we do this. Like, when we call our kids, like, I call my, my daughter. I'm like, come here, sweetheart. Or, hey, honey. Or I'm talking to my son. I'm like, hey, son, come here. But if it's, you know, they're in trouble, I call them something totally different. Timothy, Jacob, get over here. You know, like, I'm upset. You know, it's a whole different thing. The thing is, we know that Simon's name had been changed to Peter when he had met the Lord, and the Lord had changed his life, and he was operating in God's spirit. His life had been changed. His name had been changed to Peter. And here he is, kind of in his old ways, sleeping when he's supposed to be praying, sleeping when he's supposed to be watching, and instead of Jesus calling him by his new name, Jesus says, Simon, why are you sleeping? He's not doing what he's supposed to do. Well, verse 39, again, he, that is Jesus, went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. I mean, what do you say at that point? Like, yeah, I'm sleeping again. What do you say? They don't even know what to say. Then, verse 41, they came a third to, he came a third time them, again to them and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? This is the third time. It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The Lord had given them very specific instruction. All you got to do is... Sit here, watch, pray, 
Make sure you're not entering into temptation. And we, you know, watch. When you watch, you've got to be prepared, right? That something's about to happen. Watch and see what's about to happen. Well, then and immediately, in verse 43, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and took him. One minute, there they are, supposed to be watching, supposed to be praying, supposed to be seeing the Lord and what's happening. One moment that's happening, the next moment there's a flash mob in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, these people show up, they got clubs, they got swords, they're ready to bind Jesus. Now let's take a look at what happens next. Verse 47, and one of those who stood by, and we know from John's gospel that the person who stood by was Peter, drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Let's end this historical account right here. And let's ask the question, what is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this? Peter pulls out a sword and cuts the guy's ear off? And Jesus is telling him, like, Peter, what are you doing? We know that he tells Peter in Matthew's gospel, don't you know I can call 12 legions of angels down right, right now? I mean, one angel kills hundreds of thousands of people. One. He can call 12 legions. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of them down at any moment that he wants. And he's like, what are you thinking, Peter? Come on. Peter had zeal for Jesus. But Peter's zeal was misguided. And well, even though he had misguided zeal, doesn't mean that misguided zeal is exclusive to Peter. Misguided zeal manifests itself today in Christians all over the world. Maybe you guys have heard about the man over in Florida, he's a pastor over there who, want, who was going to burn the Koran out in public. He's going to take this book of Muslims, take it outside, and just burn it. Now, this guy, does he have zeal for the Lord? I'm guessing he probably does. Is his zeal misguided? I'm guessing it probably is. I'm thinking that's just not going to win people over to Christ. Because here's the thing. People that were nothing, nothing like Jesus, liked Jesus. People that were nothing like him, liked him. They flocked to him. They wanted to be around him. And the thing is, if people that were nothing like Jesus liked him, don't you think that if we're supposed to be modeling our life after him, if we're supposed to be becoming more like him, that people that are nothing like Jesus should like us? I'm just, I'm just thinking that that might be a good way for us to approach life. And I'm just thinking if we go out there and we take the Koran and we burn it out in public, I don't think they're going to like us. I just don't think they will. It's not going to have the results that God wants us to have in this life. What about Christians that stand out on the side of the road with picket signs? I'll throw a picture up here. There's some Christians out there with picket signs. God hates fags? I mean, come on. We're going to put stuff out there. Now, do these people have zeal for the Lord? I'm going to tell you they probably do. Is their zeal for the Lord misguided? I think it probably is. I've seen picket signs that say God hates Obama. God hates fags. Thank God for AIDS. I mean, you, you name it. You've seen the worst out there. Now, do you think that the unbeliever is going to walk by people holding that and go, you know what? I want to be with those people. I want to hang out with them because they seem real loving. I don't think so. I was with my family. I was at Huntington Beach, and we were walking along the beach, and there was a surf contest. I like to surf. I like to be at the beach. I thought it was cool. I was there with my wife, my two kids. We're having fun. Walking along surf contest. Pro surfers are out. We're at Huntington Beach. Bright sunny day. Awesome. And as we're walking, I hear this guy screaming. 
And I hear, as I'm getting closer, I can hear him screaming. I can, the screaming's getting louder and louder. All of a sudden, I can hear what the guy's saying. And he's screaming at people. You go into that beer tent over there, you're going to go to hell. You, if you wear that, that, that bikini, you're going to hell. And he's just ripping on these people, screaming at them, telling them, turn or burn. I mean, it just was awful. And here's the thing is, I'm listening to this, and I have zeal for God. I don't want to be around that guy. And I'm thinking, if I love the Lord, and I'm on the same team as you, why is it that I don't want to hang out with you? If I don't want to be around you, why would an unbeliever want to be around you? An unbeliever's not going to want to be around that. That's not drawing them into a love relationship with Christ. Now, did that guy have zeal for the Lord? I think he probably did. Was his zeal misguided? I think it probably was. People who were nothing like Jesus liked him. Peter got three things wrong as Peter was addressing this issue. And it's three things that many Christian believers get wrong today. And I want to share three of those things with you this morning. The first thing that Peter got wrong was that he got the wrong enemy. Peter had the wrong enemy. This guy, Malchus, the servant of the high priest, that's what he was. He was the servant of the high priest. He was the slave to the high priest. He was doing what his master made him do. He's in bondage to his master. And Peter strikes him with a sword and cuts off his ear. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Peter had the wrong enemy. And we find oftentimes that we're at war with slaves to Satan. We, have, we find ourselves at war with the wrong person. Let me tell you something. That Muslim woman at Walmart that you see shopping and her head's covered, that woman is not your enemy. People marching in a gay parade... Those people are not your enemy. The nurse or the doctor at the abortion clinic, that person is not your enemy. They're not. Those people are in bondage the same way you and I were in bondage before the Lord came into our hearts and set us free. Those people need to be loved those people need to see grace. Those people need to be encouraged to do the things that are right. Those people need to be loved. I say that woman at Walmart is not your enemy, the Muslim woman shopping. I say that, and I'm embarrassed to say the reason I say that is because I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of walking through Walmart and seeing a woman with her head covering and knowing what Islam stands for and saying, how dare her be in our country and, and having that attitude like I'm better than her. I'm not better than her. She is a person who's in bondage. I was in bondage. God set me free. Does that make me better than her? Absolutely not. And you know what? There was something that drew me to God, and it wasn't somebody's finger in my face, and it wasn't somebody making me feel like I was nothing. It was people who loved me. It was people who encouraged me. That's what drew me into a relationship with God. <laughs> Peter had the wrong enemy. And not only that, but Peter also used the wrong weapon. That's our second thing this morning. Peter used the wrong weapon. Peter grabbed a sword. And now a sword in Peter's time was a very appropriate weapon for certain circumstances. But not the circumstance that Peter was in. For that circumstance, his weapon was completely inappropriate. We're told in 2 Corinthians 10 that we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. 
Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 6 to tell us what these spiritual weapons are. God's weapons are the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. That's the spiritual weapons that we're supposed to be using as we fight this battle against the principalities and powers. Those are the weapons we're to arm ourselves with. Peter grabbed that sword and he made a mess. Made an absolute mess and the Lord had to clean up after him. The Lord had to come by and heal that man's ear. But later on, on the day of Pentecost, Peter grabbed the sword of the Spirit. He was filled with God's Holy Spirit. And on that day, he preached a message and over 3,000 people were saved. When he used the right weapon, he got the right result. So not only did Peter... Not only did Peter, <laughs> gosh, I just feel bad thinking about him in that because we're ragging on him right now. <laughs> not only did Peter use the wrong enemy, or uh, have the wrong enemy, not only did he use the wrong weapon, but Peter also used the wrong strength. I mean, he messed up. And we do too, all the time. But we become more and more consistent in our lives. Peter used the wrong strength, he was in the flesh. He was sleeping when he was supposed to be praying and watching. Peter was acting out of emotion instead of acting in the Spirit. God tells us that we're to abide in Him. He is the vine. We are what? We're just branches. We draw from Him. We get our courage from Him. We get our strength from Him. We get our wisdom from Him. We get everything that we need from Him in order to do the things that He wants us to do. When we do it on our own, it doesn't have the results that God wants us to have. And here's the thing. Some people use the right weapon, use the right weapon in the wrong strength. They use the right weapon. This is the right weapon, right? God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the bone and marrow. Powerful weapon right here. And somebody using it in their flesh, in the wrong power, it does so much damage. People will take God's word and they'll just stab people with it. Oh yeah, well take that. Here's a scripture, take that. And they're like waving it around and they're like, look at this. And they poke it at people and chopping at people. And, and yeah, it's God's word, but they're doing it in their flesh. They're doing it of their own power and they're trying to make themselves feel good. They're trying to make themselves feel powerful. They're trying to make themselves feel right. And they're taking God's word and using it in a way that God didn't want it to be used. They're just jabbing people with it. It's the right weapon, but it's the wrong strength. God doesn't want us doing that. Well, getting back to Romans, if you guys would, Romans chapter 10. Paul says that Israel had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They, they were wanting to do things for the Lord. They wanted to do things that were right, but they weren't doing it with the knowledge that they had to have. Now, as I was thinking about that, I thought, man, this is a very offensive statement. Yeah, you guys, you guys are wanting to do what's good, but you just, you don't know. I'm thinking like, wow, you're, you're talking to these people who have studied God's word their entire life. You're talking to people that try to live by the law all day long. These people know God's word. They preach God's word. They're, they're all about God's word. And you're saying they don't know? I mean, it's kind of offensive. Yeah, you guys are trying to do what's right, but you just don't know. Well, what is this knowledge that Paul's speaking of? Verse 3, he says, For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the knowledge that Paul's talking about is that we have to lay aside our own righteousness and admit complete failure. That we don't add up to the righteousness of God. That we have failed. And then we need to put His righteousness on us. That's something that most Jewish people then and now and most religious people now don't want to do. They're not willing to admit that they failed. They're not willing to admit that they fall short of God's glory. 
And Paul goes on to say in verse 5 that Moses writes about the righteousness, which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. In other words, if you do everything that you're supposed to do, if you do everything that's laid out in the law, you do it perfectly, and you never mess up, you're going to go to heaven. Well, that's not very comforting to you or to me, is it? It's not very comforting because we know that we're going to mess up. We've messed up already. We're going to mess up this afternoon. We're going to mess up tomorrow. We know this. We're not perfect. So it's not very comforting to know that. But I love what Paul says because it's very comforting in verse 6 and 7. He says, but, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring him back up from the dead. So in other words, you don't have to search for Christ in heaven and bring him down to you. You don't have to go down into the depths of the earth to search for Christ. There's no mystical, impossible journey that we have to take through the universe to find Christ. Verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you. The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if you, and here's a classic verse in the Bible, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the knowledge that Paul's referring to. This knowledge that everybody that believes in their heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, they'll confess it with their mouth. They're going to be saved. They're going to be saved. In all our zeal, as we go about life and we're zealous for God, if we lose sight of that, if we start to think that we're better than other people, if we start to look down on people, our zeal will have lost It'll be so misguided and it'll have such a bad effect. We will have cut their ear off and they won't want to hear what we have to say. We don't want to cut their ear off. We want to show them love. (coughs) We want to show them love. And as I close this morning, I want to ask you guys the same question that Billy Graham asked his audience back in 1984. What will you be like as a Christian 10 years from now? Will you be people that are full of correctly guided zeal? Are you going to be full of zeal and out there serving God and doing the things that he wants you to do and having a good effect on your family and your communities? Or are you going to be people who have lost that love for the Lord? People that have totally misguided zeal, out having bad effects for the kingdom. How can you keep your zeal? How can you stay focused on what God wants you to do? How can you be out there and excited to be a Christian? How can you maintain that in your life? It would be ideal this morning if I could give you a maximum zeal list. Here's your list. Just follow these steps and you will have zeal all your life. You'll never fall short. You're going to never stumble. You'll be always in the spirit. If I could give you that list this morning, I would. And if you have that list, give it to me, because I'd like to have a copy. That list just doesn't exist. It's not out there. Unfortunately, our life here on earth is very complex. We have trials. We have temptations. It's not easy here on earth. There is no maximum zeal list. But as your pastor this morning, I can encourage you to do a few things. The first thing I can encourage you to do is pray. Peter should have been up praying. That's what the Lord told him to do. He said, watch and pray. It's interesting to me that the only thing that the apostles asked the Lord to teach them was how to pray. They didn't say, hey, Lord, show me how to walk on water. I'd really like to do that. Or Lord, hey, how did you raise that guy from the dead? Show me how to do that. They didn't ask him that. The only thing they said was, Lord, show us how to pray. We want to know how to do that. You know why? Because as they're watching him, They're seeing that he's communicating with the Father, and then these amazing things happen. They happen when he's talking to his Father. They knew where the power came from. It came in prayer. Hey, just pray. Just stay here a while and pray, would you? So this morning, I want to encourage you guys, pray. 
Pray. Talk to God. Listen to God. Find out what he has to say to you. If you are out being zealous for God, you better have heard from him. God wants to talk to you. And the second thing this morning is read God's word. Read God's word. 1 Thessalonians 2 says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. God's word does something in you. It does something in you. It's, it's, it's amazing. Just like you eat food and it starts this reaction in your body and it does something, as you read God's word, as you take it in, the Bible tells us it works effectively in you. It'll do something in you. And if you're out being zealous for God, you better have that spiritual nourishment. Fill yourself up. I was talking to Pastor Scott, and one of the things we've noticed, in, and, and I can tell you this without doubt, that as for years now I've been doing counseling, Every time I've talked to anybody who's having any trouble, every time, there hasn't been one time where they're, they're telling me, yeah, I'm reading the Bible as much as I should. Every time they're like, no, I, I know I haven't been reading as much as I should. I should pick it up. You know, I know I haven't, you know, I haven't been reading it enough. And I'm telling you guys, read God's word. Listen to what he has to say. Trust in his word. Trust in his sovereignty. Trust that what he's written down is true and it's accurate and it's helpful. God wants you to know his truth. The third thing I want to tell you this morning is serve God. In Hebrews chapter 10, it tells us that we spur one another on towards love and good deeds. I'm looking around. I see people here that serve. I'm telling you, you guys already know this. If you don't serve, you don't understand this yet. There is something very, very special that happens when you start serving God. You're around people that have zeal for God. You're serving God. You're a part of making church happen. It's an amazing thing. We spur each other on. And this isn't a guilt trip I'm throwing on you this morning. And it's not just because we need more people here serving at the church, even though we do. That's not what it's about. I just, as your pastor, I want you guys to have that enjoyment in your life. Now you might say, well, I've been working all week. This is my Sunday, don't you know? This is different, trust me. It's different. It is. It's different. You come in here. There's so much to do. And sometimes we sit here and we think, oh, well, they've got it all handled. No, we don't. We're, we're, it's like smoke and mirrors. We're like, we can't, we can't believe we actually make, we can't believe what God does here on a Sunday morning. But I want you guys to be a part of it. I want you to enjoy it. And there's something that happens. It's amazing. God wants to do that in your life. And as you are seeking to be zealous for God, you want to be around other people that are zealous for God. God wants to do that in your life. And the last thing I want to share with you this morning is share your testimony. Share your testimony. And, you know, it was, it was such a beautiful thing for me this morning after first service because a woman came up to me and she goes, Pastor, I want to share my testimony with you. And she said, you know, I've, I've been coming here week after week and every week I have a question and I come in here and God answers it. Every week, she goes, I was at the store, I don't know what store she said, but she, I was at the store, and this man was screaming, he had a Bible in his hand, he was screaming at people, and I just, I didn't know how to feel about it, I didn't know what to say, and then the cops came, and they were talking to the guy, like, she goes, it was, I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what to feel, and I came in here this morning, and I heard this message, and, you know, she was just sharing this with me, and you have no idea how encouraging that is for me. Like, man, the Lord speak it through, and it's an encouragement for me. And I'm telling you, as you get out there and you share your testimony with people, you're going to bring God into their lives in a way they need it that day. I needed that today. That was cool for me. And as you share your testimony, you're going to share God with, in a way that people need. They need it. They want it. They, they're starving for it. And for some reason, believers have become more and more shy about sharing God with other people. Don't be shy about that. He's done amazing things in your life. He loves you. He cares for you. Don't keep that all to yourself. Share it with other people. God wants us to be those people that love people, that other people want to be around us. Let's be like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.